Welcome to the JTV Caribbean News. I am Sean Rose. United States President Barack Obama has decided to lift the U.S. designation of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. In a message to Congress, the White House said the long-awaited decision effectively removes the principal impediment to establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries, as pledged by Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro last December. Congress has 45 days to consider Cuba's removal from the list before it becomes effective, but cannot interfere with Obama's decision without voting separate legislation, a measure that the White House has deemed unlikely. Raul Castro met with Barack Obama at the Summit of Americas in Panama on April 12. It was the first time the two countries' leaders held a formal meeting in more than half a century. At a news conference in Panama on Saturday, Obama said the majority of the American people, as well as the majority of Congress, approve of his opening to Cuba. More in this BBC report. The moment was fleeting, but it's taken more than half a century to get here. A formal handshake signifying an attempt to move on from the enduring Cold War hostility between Cuba and America. At the America summit, Barack Obama said this was an historic moment. The United States will not be imprisoned by the past. We're looking to the future and the policies that improve the lives of the Cuban people and advance the interests of cooperation in the hemisphere. Now, this shift in U.S. policy represents a turning point for our entire region. For his part, Raul Castro launched a familiar and long tirade against Yankee imperialism in the region. But then something very unfamiliar. I pienso que su forma de ser obedece a ese origen humilde del... He lavished praise on President Obama, saying he was an honest man and that what had happened before was not his fault. What had gone before was a series of calamitous missteps on both sides. After the last official meeting, when Fidel Castro met then Vice President Nixon in 1960, came the Bay of Pigs fiasco, an ill-fated attempt by CIA-backed rebels to overthrow the regime. And then, most dangerous of all, the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world came to the brink of nuclear war over the sighting of Soviet ballistic missiles near Havana. Since then, relations have been icy cold. This regional conference of Latin American leaders doesn't normally attract that much attention, but this year is different. It has become the Castro and Obama show. Important for Cuba and America, yes, but important too for the rest of Latin America. This is obviously a historic meeting. And at the end of this summit, the two men have sat down for detailed talks, a picture that would have been simply unthinkable even a year ago. There is still a long way to go, but the direction of travel is clear. Cuban-American relations are warming up finally. 90% of the mandates put forward at the Summit of the Americas have been reached. President of Panama Juan Carlos Valera Rodriguez told delegates at the conclusion of the summit that 42 out of 48 mandates were agreed on, while the others were left to be considered by a small number of countries. In higher education, Valera said leaders proposed closer ties between universities and the public sector. Attendees applauded the proposal for the creation of an inter-American education system to improve the quality of education in the hemisphere. Similarly, he said leaders supported efforts to ensure universal access to health as a basic human right. With energy being a central pillar of sustainable development, Valela said agreement was made on actions that will guarantee access to energy from a range of sources that are environmentally friendly, economically affordable and reliable. The seventh summit of the Americas, the first in history that included representatives of the 35 independent countries of the hemisphere, concluded following addresses by the 27 heads of state and government, five foreign ministers and three permanent representatives to the Organization of American States. The government of St. Lucia is moving towards the development of wind and geothermal energy. St. Lucia has erected a test tower to help assess the potential for the construction of a 12-megawatt wind farm in Denery, the first utility-scale renewable energy project on the island. The test tower will be used to collect data on wind speed, wind direction, humidity, and barometric pressure for about six months. The wind initiative complements the exploration for geothermal energy currently taking place in Sufre, 
which is seeking to provide a 15 megawatt base load facility with a view to expanding to 30 megawatts. St. Lucia is carrying out aerial and ground surveys of proposed geothermal sites to determine the possibility of developing geothermal energy with $800,000 in assistance from the Government of New Zealand. St. Lucia is looking to achieve 35% renewable energy independence by the year 2020. Leader of the Opposition in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Honorable Arnim Eustace says the new St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Harris, is a champion for democracy. Eustace made the comments during a visit to the St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister's office on April 15. The Vincentian Opposition leader said he was proud to have supported the cause of democracy and see the leader of Team Unity, Dr. Timothy Harris, be elevated to the high position of Prime Minister. Prime Minister Harris said he is extremely appreciative of the support and the leadership role Arnim Eustace played in the fight for the preservation of democracy in St. Kitts and Nevis and by extension in the region. And finally in this week's Caribbean news segment, the Jamaica Government Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act 2015, commonly referred to as the Ganja Law, came into effect on Wednesday, April 15. The Ministry of Justice said the legislation is expected to have a number of positive implications for Jamaica, including strengthening respect for the rule of law and building a more just society by eliminating a common cause of corrosive antagonism between the police and young men, particularly in less affluent communities. It said the legislation would reduce the heavy burden of cases on the resident magistrates' courts and acknowledge the constitutional rights of the Rastafari community who use ganja as a sacrament. In addition, the government said the legislation paves the way for the emergence of a lawful, regulated, legitimate medicinal and industrial marijuana industry that may have significant economic opportunities and benefits. That's it for the JTV Caribbean News. I'm Sean Rose. And coming up next on JTV News. The Premier and Finance Minister is again explaining the financial position of the BVI when the NDP took office in 2011, listing a litany of financial irregularities under the VIP administration that he said led to a backlog of accounting records. And Shana Smith talks to JTV News about her decision to join the NDP, hear why she said it was a difficult decision. Plus, Sean Rose reports from Anagada, where students helped with an island-wide cleanup and discovered that adults are largely responsible for illegal dumping. <laughs> 